Good evening and welcome to those who are here in this room in the sound of my voice and to those who are watching online, including those who will eventually watch the recording. It is a pleasure to be together and we're so grateful that you're here. My name is Sarah Birmingham Drummond and I serve as founding dean of Andover Duke Seminary at Yale Divinity School and I welcome you to this Woodbury Leadership Workshop. I'm going to say a word or two about that workshop now, and then I will turn over the microphone to the person who will introduce our speaker for this evening. 60 years ago, a family in Worcester, Massachusetts, made a donation to Andover Newton Theological School to find a workshop for ministers on administrative leadership, management, administration, leadership. Back then, in those uh, mid-20th century uh, days, involved a lot of putting pieces of paper in folders, putting letters in the mail. How many students here what? own a stamp? <laughs> oh, 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 okay, okay, I, I take it back. It looked different than it looks now. The Woodbury family was detecting, however, the beginning of a change in churches, where the church that they attended, First Baptist Church in Worcester, was one where the deacons were made up of the leaders of the community, including business people in the community, who ran the business affairs of the church with an iron fist, and the pastors were abdicating responsibility for the managerial and business dimensions of the ministry, in part because they didn't have to worry about it. They had really qualified professional lay leaders, and in part because they just didn't have a clue about what it really takes to run a building, run a capital campaign, uh, manage fundraising, manage a staff. So in a way, the Woodberries were quite future focused and prophetic in thinking that there would come a time where boards of deacons didn't have qualified business leaders from the community, but rather a whole mixture of different backgrounds. They also, the Woodbury family, were a tad passive aggressive, <laughs> saying, I'm really tired of you at Andover Newton sending us ministers who don't know how to manage a church. And yet their money was green, so we took it, and we didn't argue with them 60 years ago. <laughs> And over the years, we've had numerous Woodbury leadership workshops on a number of different topics, ranging from uh, ministerial leadership in uh, technology. And that was back in 2004, a time that technology was still, uh, still quite um, mistrusted, I think is a good word in the church. We've had um, everybody from Phyllis Tickle talking about leadership in the emerging church. Peter Senge talking about leadership in the uh, fifth discipline, namely the place of leadership where we're innovating and confronting that which we've never seen before. Ron Heifetz came to offer a Woodbury leadership workshop and he, he like, dropped a lot of F-bombs. It was really quite exciting and strange. But <laughs> he dropped them from the balcony though. He, from the balcony, not the dance floor. <laughs> Tonight, we are celebrating ministerial leadership in the way that I'm starting to understand it is evolving now. Ministerial leadership of today and into the future is going to be all about partnerships. There will not be a sector of the economy that's focused on ministry and ministerial leadership. It's going to involve cities, and universities and congregations and business leaders and scientific leaders all working together. So I no longer feel like students here at Andover Newton Seminary at Yale Divinity School need to learn management or administration nearly as much as they need to learn how to build partnerships of like-minded people who all are called by God to make their communities better. So in celebration of partnerships, we have the consummate partnering person here to give us some good news about the now and future of leadership. 
and I'm delighted to turn to uh, the Reverend Dr. Uh, Frederick J. Streets, Professor of Divinity and Social Work, who is part of the teaching team for the course that is gathering here tonight, who is a member of the YDS community going back decades, and who also has a very special bond and relationship with our speaker this evening, Dr. Streets. Certainly to um, being involved and members of the faculty of Andover New Theological Seminary here at Yale, students, colleagues, friends, all. My remarks in presenting our distinguished speaker are more relational than they are biographical, but I do hope that you will take the time to read the very, very distinguished biography uh, that accompanies our guest speaker. Many uh, years ago, as Sarah referred to, uh, I having been associated with uh, YDS, an esteemed uh, preacher, pastor, former preacher, lecturer, and Robert C. Taylor said to a bunch of us aspiring pastors, uh, at that time we were all men, he said, gentlemen, you will be blessed if in your ministry as a pastor, you will have members who also become friends. Recognizing the boundaries that one ought to certainly establish between pastor and, and, and members, I am delighted to say that over the years, God has blessed me with being involved with parish ministry, the latest of which was the Dixwell Congregational Church here in New Haven, of which our speaker is a member. And over those years of being there, developed a friendship with him and his family. He embodies, I called in Heisman, embodies what is now a very popular discussion about spiritual entrepreneurs. Have you heard that term? Spiritual entrepreneurs. It is certainly attractive amongst many of our younger people who are interested in in business and community development. But here are some very brief characteristics of a spiritual entrepreneur. They put relationships first in their organizations. They create a culture of care within the organization. They embrace, almost celebrate challenges. And they recognize that business can be an instrument for solving social problems. They trust the unfolding process of leading and creating and innovating in their respective businesses. And they lift other people up within the organizational structure and in the communities in which they work. Carlton Highsmith, throughout his entire life, I would say, has been an exemplar of these now popular characteristics. He, he is an older version of a new version <laughs> of what it means to be a spiritual entrepreneur. I was thinking about the preposition at the other day, and I'll share this with Dean Drummond. It was at Yale. 35 years ago, that I met him as a student, now I distinguished dean. It was at Dixwell Church where I met Carlton Highsmith and his family and his wife, Lady Marie, who's also with us today. It was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison that Carlton worked very closely with Dr. Mercio Johnson Lee dear friend, Dr. King, and a provost there, who turned out to be my most beloved college professor in Ottawa, Kansas. At, here at Yale, here at Dixwell, here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, 
It's amazing when we think about all the roads that you and I have traveled, how it is that those roads now lead us to this particular moment here at Yale to hear Carlton Highsmith share his life and his visions and his work as the uh, lecturer tonight. And so it is with pleasure and honor that I introduce to you not uh, my member, because I'm no longer a pastor, but I'm thankful that we're still friends. Thank you so much, Reverend Streets. That was incredibly kind of you. When uh, Dean Drummond asked that I deliver remarks this evening, the first call I made was to Reverend Streets. I wanted his advice and counsel on how I should handle my remarks tonight. Jerry was direct, as he typically is to me. He said, Carlton, tell your story, your journey. Share your experiences. Um, share with us things that will make the pastors of tomorrow that much better. So being the um, obedient servant that I am, I shall follow my pastor, former pastor's advice and counsel. Thank you, Dean Drummond, for the invitation to be with you this evening. Uh, I am extremely honored, delighted, thrilled, but I have a disclaimer to make. I hold no degree from any theological or divinity school in the world. I have never taken a course in religious studies, but yet I find myself standing before this distinguished assemblage of religious scholars, researchers, and practitioners. God works in mysterious ways, doesn't he? <laughs> I will share my journey with you this evening I will tell you about my upbringing and some of my experiences. I will share some of the initiatives I've been involved in over the last 40 years in this great city of New Haven. And I will share you, with you some of the key learnings, lessons learned from those experiences, and share with you a few reflections at the end on things I think you should think about as you go into the future, saving souls and saving our communities. But before I start my remarks, I'd like to acknowledge that 56 years ago on this evening, I was 17 years old at a high school uh, play rehearsal. And the janitor burst into the gymnasium screaming, they've shot Dr. King. This is the anniversary of his assassination. Just a moment of silence to recognize that. Thank you. Most know me as an entrepreneur. Yes, I was. I founded a package design engineering business in New Haven, uh, not very far from where we're sitting tonight. I grew that business to some considerable size before selling it about 15 years ago. And rather than retire, I decided I would devote the next phase of my life and service to others. I was asked by many, why not simply retire to some far off distant island becoming a scratch golfer. And as I reflected on why, I, th I thought perhaps, perhaps I will spend some time trying to figure out how I might get the eye of that, that or that camel through the eye of that needle. Matthew 19, 24, Mark 10, 25, Luke 18, 25. I promise. No more biblical humor, because you didn't get it. <laughs> Seriously, I've been blessed beyond my wildest dreams. I am merely the product of the love, the compassion, and the hopefulness poured into me by so many amazing people. I owe so much to so many. And I was troubled as I've watched so many in our community struggle just to survive. So many unemployed, underemployed, uh, so many impacted by food insecurity, lack of decent housing, disparities in education, in health outcomes, in life expectancy. So many who had lost all hope for a better life for themselves and their families. 
So I felt a burning need and desire to share and pass on some portion of that which I've been blessed. You see, I've never forgotten from whence I came. Poor little black boy who grew up in the segregated South of the 1950s and 60s, forced by law to attend segregated schools because my local school district refused to obey the 1954 Brown decision. With all deliberate speed, the court had ordered. But my local school district did not obey that order until 1970, the year after I graduated from high school. Many undoubtedly recall the incident that happened the day after Christmas this past year when the esteemed Reverend Barber was attempting to treat his mother to the showing of the color purple at a local theater in Greenville, North Carolina. Recall that Reverend Barber was squirted out of that theater by the local Greenville Police Department. The incident garnered international attention. But Mr. or Reverend Garber, he handled that situation with so much grace, but that's the essence of the man he is, isn't it? The incident happened in my hometown. I was born and grew up in Greenville, North Carolina. When I was a youngster, that theater would have had two entrances, one reading whites only, the other colored only. And the colored only entrance would have led up a narrow stairwell to the colored seating section in the attic. You know, today I oftentimes wonder and think about how black parents and grandparents like mine managed to protect us from the psychological effects and the mental scars of racism and discrimination. My parents and grandparents were very simple people who lived very simple lives. They had but three loves, their God, their family, and their church. They drew upon their deep faith and deep conviction in God's word to provide hope, comfort, and guidance to their children and grandchildren, teaching us to lean on each other, our faith, and God's teachings in times of struggle. We must never forget or nor should we ever diminish the miraculous achievement of so many black parents and grandparents and black communities all across this nation who managed to create nurturing environments and construct support systems that protected and preserved the self-esteem, the self-confidence and dignity of so many black children like me during the Jim Crow era. Support systems that, uh, that, that, that kept us sort of confident that we could do anything. I recall that when I was old enough to truly understand the cruel and harsh reality of legalized racism and discrimination, my grandparents and parents did their utmost to convey and reinforce the notion that my abilities were not determined by the color of my skin, nor would my future be determined by it. When I was too young to fully comprehend or understand the true nature of racism and discrimination, that surrounded us, we were protected and shielded in sometimes innovative ways by our parents and grandparents. The furthest back I can remember was the winter of 1956. I was five and a half years old. My grandma would always do the laundry on the back porch in this big old washing machine, this ringer type washing machine, except when it was too cold. Then she'd go to the local laundromat and she'd always take me with her. And I was learning to read at five and a half years old. And as we pulled up this day, I could see the two signs on the two entrances to the laundromat. And I could read them. So once we got inside, I asked my grandma, what do those signs mean, whites only and colored only? What are they there for? My grandma, without hesitating, millisecond, said, son, when you have white clothes to wash, you come into the whites only entrance, and when you have colored clothes to run to wash, you come into the colored entrance. That was my grandma's way of shielding and protecting her five-year-old grandson from the demeaning and insidious symbols of oppression those signs represented. But it was my grandfather, who had the greatest influence and impact on my life. He urged me to work hard at becoming wiser if you have wisdom, you will always be sought out. The wise will always have a seat at the table, he'd always say to me. I learned from my grandfather all that I would need to know 
about hard work, integrity, compassion, generosity, love of family, love of God, by the simple eloquence of his example. The other invaluable gift my grandfather gave me were these five empowering words that I have carried with me throughout most of my adult life. Whenever we were saying our goodbyes after a visit, the last thing he'd always say to me, I'm praying for you, boy. And I'd leave and I'd go back home armed knowing that I had my grandfather's prayers always with me. And it wouldn't matter how enormous the challenge I faced, how difficult or complex the task in front of me, how seemingly insurmountable the undertaking, how impossible the odds. It didn't matter. Because I always approached those challenges and those tasks with this self-confidence that's really difficult to explain knowing that my grandfather's prayers were always with me, gave me the courage, the confidence to boldly take on what many might have considered or regarded as impossible task. I lost my grandfather 20 years ago. He was 91. He left his imprint deeply embedded in my soul. And I will never forget the people in that small black country church back home where I was baptized over 60 years ago. Truly amazing people, people who truly loved their neighbors and showed their love every day by the way they treated each other and helped each other in times of need. Folks who took up a special offering when they learned that this poor black boy was headed off to college penniless to some far distant place called Madison, Wisconsin. And I am compelled to make special mention and pay a very special tribute to the black teachers and black administrators in those segregated black, black schools back in North Carolina that educated me and so many others like me. Those schools, separate and unequal, lacking in adequate resources, very little lab equipment, rundown classrooms, no cafeteria, second class instructional materials. But yet, those black teachers and administrators succeeded in delivering an outstanding education to black kids like me. Those black teachers in those segregated schools are not recognized enough, not celebrated enough, nor acknowledged nearly as much as they ought to be for the Herculean job they did educating so many millions of black children like me under the conditions they endured. Great example was my high school principal, Dr. Dudley Flood, one of the truly great educators of our time. A brilliant educator. He was a mentor and role model to me and so many others. I would have learned later that it was the strength of his letter of recommendation that got me admitted into the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Flood had a saying that summarized his philosophy for educating poor kids, particularly poor black kids. Dr. Flood said, children aren't who we think they are. Children aren't even who they think they are. What I've found is that children become who they think we think they are. Think of and treat them like aspiring engineers and scientists, they become engineers and scientists. Think of and treat them like doctors or lawyers, they become doctors and lawyers. I've found through my work over the years with kids that Dr. Flood's words ring as true today as they did when he first spoke them to me 50 years ago. On to the University of Wisconsin in 1969, not really knowing what to expect. I'd never sat in a classroom with a white student until that first day of class in September 1969. Wisconsin was culturally light years away from anything that I had ever experienced before. But armed with a really great academic foundation provided by those black teachers from that segregated school in eastern North Carolina, I graduated in four years. Now mind you, there were some at the university who had doubts whether I would succeed there, doubts about whether I even belonged there. Because of those doubts, they imposed a few restrictions my freshman year on the number of credits, credits I could take, also restrictions on a course levels I could enroll in as a freshman for fear that the math taught at my segregated school had not properly prepared me for calculus at UW. 
30 years later, in 1999, I was invited back to Madison, Wisconsin to receive a Distinguished Alumni Award. I mentioned that. I mentioned that. Just to say, at the awards ceremony, in my acceptance remarks, I told the capacity audience that about those doubts and about those restrictions they had, uh, had greeted me when I first arrived at Madison. I told the audience that the university should not be so skeptical, nor should they it, it take too many, make too many assumptions about the intellectual potential of that incoming poor black student because one day, one day that poor black student just might return to receive a Distinguished Alumni Award from the university. While at Wisconsin, I had the great opportunity and honor to be taught by some truly amazing professors. A particular note is Dr. Matthew Holden. Dr. Holden, a political science professor, was the very first black to receive the PhD in political science from Northwestern University. Warned that I should avoid his classes because he was such a tough grader, I ignored that advice and enrolled in a course taught by Holden entitled African American Political Power. The course examined how blacks ought leverage their newfound political power to transform their communities. <laughs> One day in class, Dr. Holden had us debate the philosophies of H. Rapp Brown, Stokely Carmichael versus Martin Luther King Jr. And the debate question was, whose philosophy would lead to the most effective strategies for transforming the black community? You all know Brown and Carmichael, Michael a bit radical in their approach. Um, theirs was a more uh, like a black assertion of themselves, black agency, whereas Dr. King was more tending toward civil disobedience, peaceful, peaceful protest, appealing to the moral conscience of America, his approach. At the end of the debate, Dr. Holden held up a dime, 10 cents, that he said represented the amount of wealth held by blacks in America for every dollar of wealth held by white America. Dr. Holden stressed the importance of economic empowerment and wealth creation for the black community. America is a capitalistic ownership society, he stressed. Dr. Holden said there could be no meaningful transformation of the black community without an economic development wealth creation component gave examples of how wealth is created in America by entrepreneurs who create companies that turn into global enterprises. He mentioned Ford, he mentioned Rockefeller, DuPont, Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, Procter and Gamble, and the Johnson brothers in New Jersey who had an idea for a drugstore chain, and on and on and on. Entrepreneurs who created massive, massive wealth that helped found museums, art galleries, parks, zoos, great colleges and universities like this one. Dr. Holden urged us to consider entrepreneurship as a mean of, means of transforming our lives, the lives of our families and our communities. I was greatly impacted and influenced by Dr. Holden and his teachings. It was he who inspired me to someday seek to become an entrepreneur. After college graduation, I immediately went to work for a large global packaging company as a management trainee. I suffered like most other young black executives did in the 1970s and 60s, isolation, loneliness, no sense of belonging, few mentors, no advocates. It was an extremely trying time for those of us who are black with the early entrance into corporate America. We were passed over for promotions, we were oftentimes channeled in such areas as community relations and human relations and not given opportunities in marketing, finance, operations, those functional areas that would lead to the C-suite. Many of us thought that we were alone in our experiences, but we were not. In 1986, the Harvard Business Review published an authoritative, highly acclaimed article written by Edward W. Jones, Jr. entitled, Black Managers, A Dream Deferred. The brilliantly researched article documented the hardships experienced by young black corporate executives. It chronicled the common themes, the common experiences, and the common disappointments of young black executives in corporate America during the 1960s and 70s. Never really forgetting Dr. Holden's urging to explore entrepreneurship, I began in 1982 
planning my exit from corporate America. In 1983, I founded my company, leveraging four important pillars that I call my core competencies. Laser focus on customer, customer service, meeting exceeding customer expectations, innovation in all of its different forms, operational excellence, flawless execution on all initiatives, and a continuous improvement culture, driving quality and service improvements while at the same time lowering cost. Had a rocky start as a new found, well, newly minted entrepreneur. After a couple of years, thanks to my grandfather's prayers, I began to leverage a series of really strong relationships and, and significantly grew my business. And by 2009, I had built a $200 million business. Now let's talk about the organizations that I've founded here in New Haven that have, have, have had such a profound impact upon the lives of so many. I'll start with New Haven I Have a Dream Foundation. The Have a Dream Foundation idea came from Eugene Lang, an entrepreneur from New York City. Story goes that Eugene Lang had returned to his elementary school in Harlem to deliver a speech to sixth graders. While he was there, he was appalled at what, what he saw. The kids were undisciplined, disrespectful, but even worse, the teachers and administrators, they had such low expectations for those children. Say to him, they have no future. He was so upset that he threw away his prepared remarks and made a pronouncement spontaneously that said, if you graduate from high school, I will pay your college tuition. And that dramatic pronouncement became the founding idea for the I Have a Dream Foundation, a model that calls for a local community to establish a foundation, a local foundation, that then adopts an entire class of elementary school kids called Dreamers, providing them with tutors and mentors and all the support mechanisms required to get them to graduate from high school, then pay their college tuition. It seems some students here at the Old Divinity School heard about that project and decided New Haven needed to have one of those. And so some ambitious, ambitious students started to research, travel around the country to look at what other communities were doing, and started to hold info sessions here at the Divinity School, inviting community leaders, business leaders, civic leaders, lawyers, accountants. They did an incredible job, an incredible job of getting the right people in the room. I know that to be true because they got me in the room. And I tell you, it's hard to get me into a room in 1993 when I was running my business, but they did. But not just me, Marilyn Garcia, Will Mebbin, Skip Masbach, Bob Wheeler. And one of the really talented YDS students at the time who was helping lead the effort was Chris Coons, who's currently the senior senator from Delaware. Chris also served on our board. I agreed to become the local IHAD sponsor and helped to get the project launched. I later became the IHAD board chairman. We raised a million dollars it would take to launch the IHAD initiative here in New Haven. We hired our first executive director, Matt Lieberman, yes, the son of Joe, who passed last week. In 1994, we adopted the entire fourth grade class at East Rock Community School here in New Haven and we wrapped our collective arms around those 56 dreamers, providing them with mentors and tutors and support systems they would need to succeed. And in 2003, we graduated 46 of our 56 dreamers, 80% of them. At the time in New Haven's graduation rate was hovering in the 40s. And 100% of our students went off to a two-year, four-year trade school or technical school. Members of the partnership included the Yale Divinity School, Yale University, the class of 1956 at Yale, New Haven Board of Education, the city of New Haven, local businesses, local law firms, Yale Haven Hospital. We had an incredibly successful I had project by all of the important metrics that we use to assess such things. And again, it was the innovativeness, the tenacity, creativity, and grit of the YDS students and faculty that were the primary reasons that I had project was even brought to New Haven and became such a success. 
second organization I want to talk about, the Connecticut Center for Arts and Technology, CONCAT. The burning question for us, is there anything worse than living in poverty? The answer is yes. Living in poverty with no hope. How do you bring hope to an impoverished community? That's the problem we at CONCAT set out to solve for over a dozen years ago. But thanks to MacArthur genius Bill Strickland of Pittsburgh, he developed and tested a theory that seemed to be working. Strickland's work seemed to validate it. If you could somehow re-inspire the hopeless poor, you could begin to address some of their other underlying conditions and problems, such as self-esteem, self-confidence, agency, pride, education, training, employment, career. The essential and central element of Strickland's thesis was environment. Surround the hopeless poor in beautiful spaces, filled with fresh flowers, having lots of sunlight, with inspiring pieces of art sprinkled throughout, with smooth jazz music in the background, great food, surround them with, in, in, with loving people who show their love, surround them with compassionate people who show them compassion, surround them with respectful people who care and show them respect. That's what we do at CONCAT. Strickland had, had validated that once inspired with renewed hope, teach the poor world-class skills while also teaching them soft skills to enable them to survive in today's knowledge economy. That's what we do at CONCAT. We believe at CONCAT that the poor and hopeless must be shown what success looks like, and we show them. We believe at CONCAT the poor and hopeless must be able to envision new possibilities for themselves and their families, and we show them. And at CONCAT, we do all these things every day. And I invite you to please come visit us at Four Science Park. CONCAT provides adult training programs, uh, intensive technology training programs in phlebotomy, the health sciences, biosciences, lab technician, animal husbandry, culinary and hospitality. We've trained and placed hundreds of previously poor New Haveners in well-paying jobs and careers, all free of charge, no cost to them. We have youth programs, after-school programs, and a wide range of robotics, digital arts, graphic arts, performing arts. We also have a summer arts academy where our students have studied the art, the literature, food, music of Harlem and the Harlem Renaissance, of Detroit and the Motown story. CONCAT is one of 17 independently operated Strickland-inspired centers around the world. Bill Strickland has visited us often here in New Haven and proudly applauded the work that Eric Clemens, our CEO, and his team have done in exceeding the visionary expectations of his model. When new centers are being contemplated by groups and communities around the world, a pilgrimage to New Haven and a benchmark of CONCAT is a must-stop. And finally, let's talk about CONCORP, our community outreach and revitalization program. The CONCORP vision is to create a community where all citizens are thriving economically and socially, and to bring beauty and dignity to New Haven's neighborhoods that have been underinvested in for decades. We at CONCORP have launched so many amazing initiatives and partnerships all designed, again, to economically empower, bring beauty and dignity to New Haven's poorest neighborhoods. These are but a few of our initiatives. So we partner with the United States Small Business Administration and Quinnipiac University School of Business to establish our Entrepreneurship Academy for Black-owned businesses. CONCORP has created a residential real estate investment unit to purchase and rehabilitate blighted properties throughout New Haven returning them to the housing stock as affordable housing units. We've returned dozens of affordable housing units in just four short years we've been at that work. CONCORP has created our Orchid Catering and Hospitality Business Unit and is rapidly becoming one of New Haven's fastest growing and most highly regarded catering and hospitality businesses, while providing dozens and dozens of well-paying jobs to graduates of our CONCAT Culinary Arts School. CONCAT has partnered with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and become a beta testing site for designing, testing, and 
incubating wealth building strategies for underserved communities. And CONCAT's signature project is a redevelopment of Dixwell Plaza into CONCAT Place on Dixwell. Drawings of what that development is going to look like are spread around the room. It's a $200 million residential, cultural, commercial retail development that promises to revitalize an entire neighborhood. The new development is going to have an expanded CONCAT training center, a Hill Health Family Trauma Center, a Friends-run infant and daycare center for 80 kids, 200 new housing units, a new grocery store and food hall, open public gathering space, cultural performing arts center, commercial office space, all designed to transform a community that has been underinvested in for decades. What are some of the key lessons I'd like to share with you about the wonderful work done by those three organizations over the last 30 years here in New Haven? How have we been able to forge such effective collaborations and stand up such high performing organizations? Of course, it must all start with having wonderful people to help lead and manage the organizations. And we have been blessed with some of New Haven's finest. I speak of individuals like Eric Clemens, Paul McRaven, Anna Blanding, Steve Griffin, Opal Harmon, Gideon Gabricius, Chef Jenna Martin, Andrew Ashatino, Ian Williams, and so many more amazing, talented people. I'd offer up these six additional attributes as essential to the success of these three organizations. We did not compare notes, but Dr. Streets nailed it. Relationships. It's been my experience that building relationships based on shared values and shared visions are the most valuable and most important key lessons learned for forging really robust, resilient, and lasting partnerships. Relationships really do matter particularly with respect to building partnerships. Integrity and trust. I've long embraced the view that integrity and shared values are cornerstones of almost all solid relationships. And I've never wavered or departed from this view in my interactions with our CONCAT and CONCORP management teams, my colleagues on the board, our donors, our client populations, and of course, our collaboration partners. It's been my experience that you build Mutual trust with a rigorous commitment to open dialogue and open communication. And showing up every day as your consistent and authentic self, doing what you promised, or explaining why you can't keep your promise, and slowly but surely you're gaining the trust of most. Having clearly stated goals and objectives, I found that the most effective partnerships come together when there is a clarity in defining the problem you're trying to solve and alignment around identifying what success looks like vis-a-vis -vis clear goals and objectives. Without a set of clearly articulated goals and objectives, you won't know if you're making progress towards solving the problem. Four, have strategies that are rigorous, innovative, and robust, and continuously assess them. For each of our organizations, we have very thoughtfully conceived and clearly articulated set of program strategies. I encourage you to look for partnerships that are dynamic, agile, innovative, rigorous, because the problems our communities face are getting more complex and will require smarter initiatives to solve them. Five, clearly identified resource requirements and source of resources. All of the organizations I've described tonight are formal 501c3 organizations with formal annual budgeting and processes that identifies all sources and all expenditures planned for the year. But it doesn't matter whether the initiative or partnership is formal like ours, or it could be informal, like the ones that you may become part in. But there must be clarity surrounding what resources will be required for the partnership or initiative to operate. You should not only know and understand what those resources are, but what will be the source of those resources including understanding what you will be contributing to the partnership. Your contribution need not be money. It could be human capital, the volunteer expertise that
that you or members of your congregation might bring, your thought leadership, or space in your church. Whatever is to be your contribution, it should be clearly conveyed and understood by all. And finally, effective governance. Please don't underestimate the importance and value of effective governance to the success of IHAD, CONCAT, and CONCORP. I've worked extremely hard over the years ensuring that our organizations have sound, solid, and effective governance structures in place. We've recruited and assembled incredibly talented directors on the boards of both CONCAT and CONCORP, all recruited because of their specific expertise, talent, experience, and backgrounds. CONCAT and CONCORP boards are actively engaged in providing fiduciary oversight, credible challenge, and visionary guidance to both CONCAT and CONCORP management teams. My counsel is that you fully know and understand how decisions will be made within the partnership and decide what role, if any, you desire to play in making those decisions happen. Now for a few reflections as my time grows nigh. The problem that I see in our communities are real and they are complex. I urge that the pastors approach their community partnership work with clear eyes, open hearts, and reasoned minds, recognizing that the complexity of the challenges the community faces will require innovation, smartly designed and well-planned executed initiatives, and having spent the last decade and a half of my life deep, deeply immersed in the work to eliminate injustice and disparities in a black underserved community, I have come to the realization that it will take time, a very long time, to achieve the ultimate goal of a truly fair, more just, and more equitable life for the citizens of this community. Please let me amplify my point with a true short story from one of our recent community engagement meetings regarding our Dishwell Plaza project. A young mother approached me and said, Mr. Highsmith, a mother who lives in Cheshire, she can take her daughter out for an ice cream cone anytime she wants because she has many ice cream parlors to choose from. But I can't take my six-year-old daughter out for an ice cream cone because we don't have a single ice cream cone parlor anywhere in this neighborhood. Why, why don't we have an ice cream parlor in our neighborhood? Nearly in tears, she ended with, doesn't my little girl deserve to enjoy an ice cream cone just like that little girl who lives in Cheshire? And I was greatly moved by that young mother's tearful plea. And I was reminded of something that Thurgood Marshall once said while praising and lauding the enormous progress that blacks had made just in his lifetime. Let me paraphrase what Marshall said. Yes, we have achieved great progress in my lifetime, but we need to stop talking about how much progress we've made and bragging about how far we've come. We need to start talking about how much further we still have to go and how long a distance we still have to travel to achieve true equality in this country. For we will not have achieved our goal of equality until a little baby born to the poorest and dumbest Negro woman in Mississippi has the same rights, the same opportunities, and the same possibilities for her life as a baby born to the wealthiest and most privileged white family in America. We know it's not true, but in America, that should be our goal, nothing less. It will take a very long time for us to achieve the more just world that Marshall describes, won't it? But that should not deter us, nor should the realization that the journey to that more just world will most likely be completed not in our lifetimes. That, would, that should not discourage us either from doing all that we can during our lifetimes to advance us toward that more just society. Just like the unselfish millions who made uh, centuries-long commitments to design and build the many great churches of Europe with the full knowledge and understanding that they would never live to see or worship in those completed structures. Nevertheless, they persevered and toiled on year after year, decade after decade, century after century, 632 years to build the Cologne Cathedral, 800 years to build the St. Mark's Basilica in Venice, Sustained and determined perseverance. Such should be the mindset of those of us who work and strive for a more just world. Though we may not live to see the world that Marshall describes, 
What we must insist upon, what we must demand, is progress. Progress in our lifetimes. We must see poor people being lifted out of poverty, kids being educated, health outcomes improving, and those suffering from food insecurity having enough to eat. We must assist that we see life being made better for those most challenged in our community. We must see the young mother that I mentioned earlier being able to take her little girl out to enjoy that ice cream cone in an ice cream parlor right in our neighborhood. Perhaps the most important role that you as pastors, future pastors, can bring to any collaborative partnership effort is that voice that speaks truth with unfiltered moral clarity. For what worries me greatly is that I see very, a very dangerous ism emerging and starting to permeate into far too many quarters of our social discourse. An ism that confuses, confounds, distracts, and discourages so many. I'm talking about denialism, where people will aggressively and intentionally attempt to blur the truth. Where there is not just the rejection or refusal to accept the established facts, evidence, or consensus, but an attempt to convince you that you did not see what you saw. To try to persuade you that what happened did not happen. Respected people of power and influence who should, or in some cases, do better, do no better, attempting to distort or rewrite history. 240 years of chattel slavery in America? No, nah, that, 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 that never happened. That was a, a apprenticeship training programs for Africans in America. We need respected and authoritative voices with the courage to speak the truth with moral clarity and conviction. Again, I emphasize that this is perhaps one of the most important roles that you as pastors must play in any collabor collaboration or partnership you seek to forge with external partners, especially if those partnerships are to be with business community or with political leaders. For it's been my experience, this is not meant to disparage either, that both the business community and our political leaders can sometimes have evolving priorities that may not necessarily align with what you might believe is a right priority for the moment. Business and political leaders are not always as courageous as we might hope they'd be. I attended a gathering of recently of corporate directors who represented the nation's largest corporations and organizations. Several topics were discussed at that gathering. The two that I'd like to mention this evening relate to the powerful impact of courageous voices. The power of voices willing to speak with moral truth and clarity and the persuasive impact of those voices. First conversation amongst the directors touched on whether or not companies should speak out on controversial matters of social justice. Matters like abortion rights, voting rights, gender identity rights, climate change, vaccinations. This was a timely discussion for our gathering because corporate management teams and corporate boards all across the country were having debate on, in their C-suites and in their boardrooms, thanks in large measure to the battle being waged between the Florida governor and Disney. The debate centered on whether boards should adopt formal blanket policies of making no comment or taking no position on any controversial matter no matter how consequential the issue. Most directors point out, pointed out that their company's customer base spanned across the entire country, meaning they had customers in red states, customers in blue states. With the country being so divided, they argued that their customer base would therefore likely be split 50-50 on almost any controversial issue. And to take a public stance or on a controversial issue, like abortion, would likely offend 50% of their customers no matter what position they took. So most directors who spoke argue that companies must remain silent, take no position on these issues, further arguing that these were states' rights issues, best left for the individual states to resolve and decide. It appeared that the consensus view emerging was one of neutrality, of making no comment or taking no position on any controversial issue, and acknowledging that these were indeed states' rights issues best left for the individual states to resolve. I was a bit troubled by the consensus view that was emerging. 
I asked for the floor to make a point. I said to my fellow directors, who happened to be mostly white, that I was old enough to remember when a governor stood in the doorway of a school and prevented a little black girl from entering that school because he opposed desegregation. And then the governor had argued that it was a state's rights issue that gave him the authority to prevent a little black girl from entering that school. I asked the directors if the governor had been wrong in preventing that little black girl from entering that school. They all answered yes, he had been wrong. Then I asked, what if we're confronted again one day with a situation that is as egregious and as wrong as that governor standing in that doorway? Are we okay? Are we comfortable being forced to remain silent, being bound by some neutrality policy that we had adopted? The tone and substance of the discussion shifted significantly as one director after the other spoke out that it would be wrong to remain silent if faced with such a circumstance. And I saw the consensus view slowly shift, shifting away from one of adopting a policy of absolute neutrality. There's one other important question debated at a gathering that I'd like to share with you before I sit down. The question being debated was whether DEI programs should be abandoned, whether they had outlived their usefulness. Again, I sat and listened as one director after the other spoke in favor of disbanding DEI programs. Many argued for return to the days of equal opportunity, saying that equality of opportunity should be the focus, not equity. We live in a meritocracy, and assured equity to everyone is antithetical to our meritocracy, many argued. Many seem to be ignoring or refusing to acknowledge or accept the historical context that it caused and exacerbated today's expanding disparities in housing, education, health outcomes, and wealth accumulation. Speaker after speaker suggested that DEI initiatives were no longer relevant or needed. It caused me to reflect back on a speech I'd heard one time about the why of DEI. These perspectives all contradicted my experience and my understanding that equal opportunity programs alone had not been sufficient and had failed to address systemic inequities. Inclusion emphasizes the importance of creating diverse and welcoming spaces where individuals from all backgrounds feel valued and empowered to contribute. Again, not feeling comfortable with where the discussion was headed, I again asked to convey a few thoughts to the group. Knowing and understanding that these corporate directors, who were mostly white, again, all had a penchant for numbers, graphs, and data, I asked them to, to envision a simple graph Simple pie chart with three slices. The pie chart represented 405 years. 16, 19, 18, 65, 248 years. That would be the biggest slice, 61%. 1865, 1965, 100 years. That would be 100 years, that would be uh, 25%. And they got the picture. So for the 405 years that my ancestors, have been in this country, 86% of the time we have been either legally enslaved or legally discriminated against. I said, and they never envisioned it or thought of it that way before. And I could see by the body movement, the positions changed, but it didn't stop there. I said, I turned 18 years old in 1969. Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964, Voting Rights Act in 1965, Housing Act in 1968. That meant that I am the first in my family to enter adulthood with all the rights, privileges, guarantees of the Constitution that you all have been born with. I'll tell you, the most incredibly stimulating conversation on race and DEI that I've ever been involved in happened as a result of my comments. Were hearts and minds changed by my remarks? I don't know for sure. I have an inkling that they were. But I remain convinced that when principled, conscientious, moral, factual arguments are made by respected, reasoned, and trusted voices, 
then most people will respond with, perspective, with receptive ears, open hearts, and minds that can be persuaded to do what is just, what is right, and what is fair. And that's the crucial role and vital role that I see you as pastors playing when partnering with civic government and business leaders. Yours is that principled, trusted, reasoned, and respected voice that must have the courage to speak uncomfortable truths. We need you as pastors to be that courageous voice willing to speak on behalf of the voiceless, unafraid to demand for them a more compassionate, a more equitable society. No one, no one can speak with a moral clarity or moral authority that you as pastors can speak and let your voices echo through the corridors of power, reminding them, in those in positions of power and authority, that their solemn duty and responsibility is to protect the vulnerable and to ensure fairness and justice for all. But most importantly, let your voices speak loudly and courageously to support efforts to dismantle those offensive, oppressive systems, which are the root causes of so much pain and suffering in our communities. Again, I am so grateful to Dean Drummond and so deeply honored to have had the opportunity to share with you my journey and my deep-seated hopes and prayers for a happier, healthier, more prosperous life for all of God's children. May God bless you all. And I believe we're free for a few questions. Answer a few questions. I wonder who has one to pose. <coughs> Hello. Um, my name is Marina K. Everybody. I'm a second year student here. Um, I studied business in undergrad. I, too, have the same sentiments of when I was in undergrad, I had a professor who, I went to Hampton University, um, so one of my professors, um, my entrepreneurial professor took, pushed me and pushed a lot of us to go into that, um, but I felt like I didn't know how I can navigate that space without an understanding of what was concerning to me, what I was passionate about. Um, so I really appreciate your presentation of laying that out today. Um, I was just wondering, because you were talking about the different programs that you have started, um, just could you, in great detail, you've already listed some things, but could you talk about like some of the daily things that you did on the ground, speaking to the people of New Haven to really um, understand their concerns as you were structuring the organizations that you were built for them? Oh, very good question. Uh, engagement with the community. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time on that topic because of just time constraints, but I could give a whole lecture on community engagement. Um, the thing that we found that surprised me most, particularly when we opened CONCAT 12 years ago, was how much the community did not trust us. Um, I've lived in New Haven for 50 years in Connecticut. And I just was baffled at why, why don't you trust us? We're bringing these programs to you free of charge. Why don't you trust us? And as I got to know the community better, it was because they had been lied to so often by so many city officials, so many organizations that come in and promise all these things, and they never deliver on them. So a lot of the mistrust that I found in this community was well-earned. It was deserving because they had not been, uh, promises had not been kept. Uh, what we found we had to do was to show up every day saying the same things, consistently saying the same things, delivering our promises, doing those things we say we're going to do. And ultimately, ultimately they'll, they'll, they'll see, they'll see the genuineness there. But it's one of showing up every day keeping your promises, keeping your word. But people criticize the community about being distrustful. There's a reason for that. We had, a, we had a lot of vaccine hesitancy in our community, and I was involved in so many initiatives there. Um, I mean, Dr. Desir from the Yale Health, um, we were sitting talking one day, and was, I said, Dr. Desir, why do they not trust you, your profession? He said, because we're not trustworthy. Sure. To say it's not complicated. Health profession has to become more trustworthy and then more under trust. Thank you, Mr. Heisman. I apologize. Something's blooming. <laughs> Something's blooming. Uh, Dr. Davida Foy Crabtree. 
I'm struck by your appeal for pastors to be the moral voice in the partnerships when you who are not ordained have exerted that moral voice over and over again. And it seems to me that a good part of what pastors need to do is equip their laity to be the moral voices wherever they find themselves and to build partnerships in their worlds where they, together with the clergy, can exert that moral authority. And I just want to say thank you for who you are, who you have always been, and for the presence that you have brought to this city. It's huge. Well, thank, thank you, um, Davina. Uh, I owe a lot to my religious leader, uh, Dr. Streets, preached to me often. What church, church happens, not just in this building, in this church, church happens out in the universe. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Highsmith mentioned uh, mm -hmm. Senator Coons. Um, one of those at moments again of connection. I hadn't met Carlton then, but Senator, now Senator Coons did his paper in my class on the I Have a Dream project. And I remember reading about Carlton in the group, but I had not met them. But uh, something great and good can come out of YDS. <laughs> yes. And uh, one of his colleagues that he's mentioned, Eric Clemens, uh, will be a student here in the fall. And so you can also tease, tease his mind about his work as well. What did um, what did Senator Coons get on the paper? <laughs> <laughs> Catch him in a weak moment. <laughs> he became senator. Oh. <laughs> uh, thank you, um, Mr. Highsmith, for your um, fascinating uh, story that you shared with us. Um, I mean, I learned a lot about you just in a few moments. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship with the city? Um, and politics, because New Haven is a very political town, as it is mi many um, cities. Um, talk about like what was that like um, briefly? <laughs> and those, and those <laughs> probably super complicated, um, but I'm sure it was like some zoning that had to occur, and there's some you know wrangling or some activism and lobbying that you have to do for the, for the community. And there's a reason why Dixwell had not Dixwell neighborhood had not been for many years, decades. Mm -hmm. I, I really tried to dance gingerly around that section of my remarks. I hope you could tell that I, I struggled with that part because there's so much more I could write. And perhaps when my memoirs come out, I'll write that Looking about forward. working with city government and what, that's, uh, what that entails. Um, my counsel there is... Um, I go back to relationships. It's hard to have a relationship with the office of mayor. Very difficult. It's easier to have a relationship with the person who is the mayor. I've known five New Haven mayors. Not all of them um, you want to be in a relationship with. I'll leave it that way. <laughs> others, others very charming, wanting to do the right thing all the time. Um, but unfortunately, that's why I sort of have a word of, word of caution. You have to have your eyes wide open when you're dealing with um, politicians because they don't always, they don't have the courage that we'd like them to have all the time. Um, but it takes um, a lot of hard knocks. Uh, I've been knocked down a few times by, uh, by a mayor. Uh, I've had a mayor pull out all the stops to try and prevent uh, me from um, proceeding on one of our initiatives. Um, but then that mayor didn't understand uh, the power relationship that I've been around a long time and developed a, a lot of wonderful relationships. And um, I guess you don't run a big business like I do without having sharp elbows. <laughs> so you've got, you got to know how to maneuver that as well. Well, you're very, very astute. Uh, um, maneuvering, managing through government 
is, is a challenge, is a real challenge. Thank you. I must interject that Andre, as the interim pastor of Dixwell, is now Carlton's pastor. <laughs> 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 Please join me in giving Mr. Highsmith another round of applause.